So, okay, I think we're what, just past six o'clock. So, um, yeah, let's get started. So I'd just like to uh, welcome everyone to the Sunday session. Uh, my name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of uh, these uh, weekly webinars with uh, football practitioners from around the world. Uh, this evening, I've uh, got two fantastic first team coaches with me. Before I uh, formally uh, introduce you to them, um, I'll just uh, share with you our plans for this evening and, and how you can submit your questions to Dean and, and to Sebastian. So, uh, as always, it will be a session of two halves. In the first half, we'll be sort of looking at what the guys have been doing with their training sessions, uh, preparing to uh, return to, to play. So in the first half, you just focus your questions around, around the training aspect. And then the second half, we'll be uh, looking at matches where and when uh, Dean will be sort of looking with jealous eyes at Sebastian that has uh, already played four games. They'll see Dean sort of be able to share how they're building up to that. And, and Sebastian, I think, has got a bit of data on, on the four games they've played so far. So then sort of, yeah, focus your questions on, on the matches and hopefully we'll have a, a good conversation around what that looks like in the second half of the session. So I'll introduce you to the two guys. So first of all, ever Sebastian Dreyer, who's an assistant coach at Jan Regensburg, Bundesliga two side. Sebastian, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here right now and to share um, my experiences or our ex experiences in Germany um, the last weeks and also the first few matches. And we are very glad that we can play again. And yeah, hope that you guys um, can follow um, the German way very quickly. And yeah, that's it. Um, just wanted, yeah, just if you can tell us a little bit about your role at, at Jan Regensburg and, and a little bit about the team's playing philosophy. Yeah, um, Jan Regensburg is a second league club, as you told um, us before. Um, uh, we are in the middle of the league table. We don't belong to the to the biggest clubs in the league. Um, we um, have one of the small smallest budgets in the league, so we have to work um, very very well together. And um, our style of play is that we um, want to always attack the, the opponents high up the pitch, independent of the strengths um, of the opponents, and get quick um, transitions out of this uh, out of this pressure. And uh, yeah, we also want to be very goal directed with our possession. So we are not the typical possession team. We are more like um, intensity games and uh, getting the, the the opponents under pressure and. Uh, we that's that's how we were successful the last years and this season we want to stay in the league and that's our um our aim okay thanks sebastian yeah uh, also with us uh dean holden the uh, assistant head coach at bristol city um dean thanks for joining us and, and likewise wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your responsibilities with the robins and and sort of briefly yeah what would be the sort of team philosophy in terms of the way you play Thanks, Steve, for the, for the invitation. It's great to talk football again after all the <laughs> sure problems around the world. So really looking forward to this. I've been on, on uh, quite a few of these as uh, looking in and watching. So really looking forward to actually taking part as a guest. So nice to meet you too, Sebastian. Um, nice yeah, to well, meet you. Pretty similar to, to, to what Sebastian's. You know, we don't try and reinvent the wheel. We're a young squad in the division competing against some, some huge teams in, in the championship with, with lots of parachute payments and stuff. So we've got to be... A little bit different to them. We've got to develop from within. We've got to maybe buy players at maybe some a little bit cheaper than what the top sort of rate is going, and then try and develop in house and, and try and win at the same time as well. So we're seventh in the table at the moment, one point out of the playoffs. Uh, so it's all to play for for us. So we, 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 you know we we're prepared and ready. I'm sure we'll get into the, the nitty gritty of how and the why uh, in this discussion. But no, we're ready to get to get back at it. Now we can't wait. It's a huge carrot in the Premier League waiting at the end of it for us. So. My fingers crossed. So, yeah, it's uh, an exciting time. I can imagine that, yeah, you're uh, sort of chomping at the leash, waiting to uh, to get back to it. Yeah, yeah, we can't wait. As I say, it's been a long time. The, the, the most important thing, of course, is that everybody's healthy and well. Um, and now we seem to hopefully be coming to the, the back end of the of the real problems. As you say, football's returning and uh, weekends are getting a little bit back, more back to normal. So, uh, can't wait. All right, fantastic. Thanks, guys. Um, just wanted just to try and give um, everyone out there 
some idea, give some context to exactly where you are at at this moment in time. So I don't know whether Sebastian, if you could kind of give us a timeline from when probably the, the last game you played prior to going into lockdown and then sort of the general progressions that you've been through in terms of being in lockdown, returning to training, whether it was group training, full contact training, and then sort of the date of your, your first game. Yeah, um, I think the best thing to do that is to show you something. Um, I've prepared something for you. Um, I share my screen. I think it works out, does it? Okay, yep, oh, perfect. Yeah, um, as you can see on the left side, uh, we had three phases. We had a uh, three weeks um, home office time. The lockdown came in on the middle of March. So this was, we were on a Friday, um, expecting to play against Kiel the next day. And then we, we got the news um, that we can't play anymore. And then we had three weeks of home office followed by five weeks of group trainings and nine days um, before the first match again. When you see the calendar on the right-hand side, um, you see that there was the lockdown in the middle of March and then the home office um, training sessions. And then we had five weeks of group trainings. The interesting thing, um, according to the group training sessions, is that we were expected um, to have two weeks of group training sessions because the first um, appointment for the restart was the 2nd of May and then it was postponed twice and we were lucky to start um, against Kiel on the 16th. So um, it was a really short time after the group trainings, as you can see, nine days um, with a quarantine camp at the end of the, of the preparation phase and then we, we had Kiel at home. So that's the point um, where we were on 16th of May. And then we are here now. Um, we had four games um, so far, um, six games, eh, I'm sorry, three games in six days here. And um, yeah, we had to use the group training sessions very well for physical um, abilities that the, the player were, players were able to do this program here. So that's um, a quick overview um, where we are now and what the last months were like. I start it again. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that, yeah. Sebastian. Yeah, we'll certainly sort of yeah look a little bit closer at those uh, group trainings, particularly how that aspect of a changing start date sort of had on, yeah. on your players' motivation, and then yeah. sort of how you progressed through the uh, full contact training to starting yeah. games again. Yeah. Um, Dean, um, similar sort of question for you. Um, so I wonder if you could sort of, yeah, sort of give us a quick overview of how long you were in lockdown. I know you've only just started training this past week. So maybe with the lockdown, sort of some of the things you've been doing in lockdown that's been preparing you, your, your players to this point where they're now on the grass and you're looking towards progressing to, to playing games again. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, it was a slightly different for us. We, yeah, middle of March, obviously, was the lockdown similar to Sebastian, we were preparing on the Friday to play, to, to travel that day to, up north to Blackburn to play a, a team in and around us in the division. We were preparing sort of set pieces and stuff and, and we got a phone call off our CEO, came to the training ground, had a, had a big meeting with all players and staff and, and literally half an hour later we left the training ground and, and we didn't return for near 10 weeks. So it was a huge challenge um, at that point. Of course, we've got quite a few foreign players, uh, some of them over in England without family. Um, and the club made a decision at that time to keep all the players in, in Bristol, uh, in England, and just make it, the uncertainty was really difficult, I think, because we, obviously, unprecedented times, there was a lot of worry, there was a lot of fear, I think, from um, maybe from the news and, and outlets and things like that. So, no one quite knew how long this was going to go on. So, the players left the training ground with as much stuff as they could take. They took exercise bikes, they took dumbbells, they took what didn't they take? Football, everything. And they left the training ground, they went. And then, they worked really, really hard uh, in the home time um, as much as they could. Obviously, we've got the GPS equipment, so they were able to keep in touch with our sports science department. We've got a really experienced uh, sort of support staff in that area of the club, so we were able to keep a real lid on the players' fitness at that point, and they were working really hard, almost as if we were maybe going to restart after three or four weeks. And then, of course, then news came through that this is going to go on a lot longer than anybody expected. So at that point, we made a decision. Um, to download the players for two weeks. So they literally 
did very little for two weeks. They could go and, and, and go for a stroll in the morning or the evening, uh, the hour that they were given by the government. Um, and at that point, we decided because who knows when the season's going to restart and then who knows when next season's going to restart. And it's going to be, as we imagine it, probably a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so in between. So if the players didn't have this two-week sort of download period at that time then, uh, probably in the beginning of April, then they were probably going to go 18 months without a break. And, uh, of course, that's no good for any football. So, yeah, so, they, so on the back of the sort of two-week lowdown, we started to build them back up. And at that time, then we introduced things like this, so the Zoom. So two or three times a week, there'd be uh, the players and the staff would be on one of these and we'd be doing an exercise or some fitness circuit training in the garden. Uh, you were able to get a, a great look into some of the players' houses and <laughs> And things like that. And it was just a way of keeping um, maybe some face-to-face -face contact with the players because I think a few of them were struggling at that point. Um, it was really tough. So it then progressed. A couple of them were able to get back to the families for sort of 10 days, two weeks, back into Europe, into different uh, countries. And I think we saw then a huge positive in terms of their mental health on the back of that. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been, as Sebastian said, we've been getting ready to come back in and then it's got delayed a little bit. And so finally, yeah, we started back Monday the 25th. Monday just gone. And we're into groups of five at the moment, so no contact. Um, groups of five, two coaches, and it's worked really well, actually. It's been, I think we had to be really creative with how we set our sessions up because of the, the protocols around the, uh, with the virus, the cleanliness and the equipment and stuff. Um, but all in all, it's worked really well. The players have come back so fit, really fit. So now we're sort of sharpening them, ready to hit the ground running in, you know, in the season. So I think the players have enjoyed that sort of close-knit you know, two coaches per five, which they don't always get, of course. So it's worked really well. We're hoping to go this week into into groups of eight and then by the end of the week, hopefully, maybe into groups of 12 and maybe even an 11 and V11 at some point, uh, maybe in a week or so. So really excited, actually. We're, the wheels are turning. And it looks like we're starting to get back to a little bit of normality. So, OK, well, fantastic. Um, let's see, with Sebastian, you've sort of had that good fortune that you're probably three or four weeks ahead of ahead of Dean. I don't know if you could share some of the uh, progressions you've been through in terms of returning to group training and then and then and then full full contact. What does what does that look like? I suppose the interesting part is the, the group training because that is something that is the kind of restriction that you're probably not used to working with and sort of having to sort of be quite inventive around that. Yeah. Um, I can I can confirm that um, that we we were very uh, we became very creative in this this phase because um, we were not allowed to to have any physical contact and um, what was very important for us was that we have in everything where it was possible a competition so a competition within the group so if um, we had only a maximum of seven players on the pitch and we tried to create exercises where they can battle each other. Or battle with the the groups um, that came later on the day. So that was very important for us. But before, um, I would like to show you something that um, yeah, we um, did some some principles. We had some some principles. Um, I would like to to share with you. Um, uh, one second. Um, so it was important for us to see the situation. Um, under football aspects and psychological aspects um, because at the beginning when there was the home office phase um, we had the players um, were so uncertain they were not sure how it how it goes on and we had as Dean also told us um, times for time for the family and uh, the, the most important thing was just every, everybody stays healthy and uh, stays yeah, safe and then we had the group trainings very early and we had this feeling um, glad we are back and the, the players could for these two hours go out of their homes and yeah have or feel open doors so this was a really good feeling for the players um, our aim was to improve group tactics um, for example with the back four and we had um, we had also turned it into um, defenders group, midfielders group and strikers group so we could work with them um, in position patterns so this was important for us on, on, on those uh, three days in the middle of the week 
and yeah we want to up, up to improve the the match endurance technical basics something like that and as you can see um the colors here in this slide we had um always on monday a coming in session we had a very intense session on tuesday and on friday and uh in between wednesday and thursday we had uh, middle intensity so we wanted to imitate the yeah the the phase that's coming um, with day x um, match on tuesday match on friday or saturday again because in germany we are not that much used to that as you are in england so um that was were our principles and we always talked in the in the coaching stuff from week to week um okay what are the aspects for this week what are we going to face in the other week and and so on this was our plan um how we managed the group training and um it was really interesting because in the beginning we had that glad we are back feeling but um day x was postponed more than once and it started to be annoying for the players and in this phase it was very important to have good competitions um to hold the motivation of the players um and not getting them annoyed because uh, it was no team training it was group training oh yeah on that dean i mean it's a it's a good point on the psychological aspect i mean you don't actually have a start an official start date at the moment so to give to the players that purpose that motivation have you looked at doing anything around that yes it's similar to what sebastian just said there one of the things we found during the lockdown was that we know how competitive these players are. To get to, to be a professional footballer in the first place, you've got to be hugely competitive in whatever you do. So they were really struggling with that. So during lockdown, we, we, we tried to do quite a few bits with them where they could even compete with each other while away from football in different ways and just, just to keep that stimulus. And then, yeah, again, in, in the training sessions that we've done this week, just gone, we've, we've done a couple of days where we've, we've kept the units together, as Sebastian just said. So we've worked with the units of the back four, we've worked with the midfielders and so on. But We've also mixed it up as well. So um, socially distancing, of course, we've been able to do s some competitive challenges where you've got you know, defenders, midfielders and strikers all working together. So um, that's the thing we found is keeping, as you just said there, the purpose is, is the biggest thing. Now, we've been really clear in, from day one, uh, starting with Mark Ashton, our CEO, with that first meeting, all the way through lockdown, we've been really clear in our communication with the players because we know what the rumour mill's like. Players talk to other players from other clubs. They hear something on social media. Uh, so we've been really clear. And I think there's been a real trust has been built upon that because I think some players have, have learned things. Players from other clubs have learned things from, from the players at our clubs because of the way we're communicating. So, you know, I'm not holding us up as, you know, how great are we? But I think to, to build trust and keep trust and that spirit that we rely on within our, our team is a huge thing for us. And we're hoping that on the back of this, we're, we're able to, for even further improve that spirit because that's going to be huge once once the game starts and I think Sebastian just touched on it there we we feel quite lucky in the sense that the program we're going to be going into Saturday Tuesday Friday Monday whatever it's going to be with the fixture schedule we will be ready for because we've, we've we've proved we can do it before um, it'll be interesting I think with the English Premier League with teams you know maybe the teams that don't play in Europe so they they're very much used to Saturday to Saturday there's a week everyone loves a week in between games you can periodize your week you can get your recovery you can do all your analysis in the meeting room we're used to sort of putting one game to bed very quickly the next day and then focusing quickly on that next one so um, that's a challenge of course physically because uh, that first game it's a question Sebastian if you don't mind Steve I'd like to maybe yeah. ask you is is all the build up all them weeks and weeks of training and getting ready and then the, the schedule changes and then that first 10 minutes of that first game, I can ima almost imagine without supporters as well, it was just end to end, end to end. And then all of a sudden you can imagine the game would settle. So how have you found uh, being able to maintain momentum when you're in on the upper hand of the opposition? And then I suppose the next question will be around recovery post game. Okay. Um, yeah, it was like uh, we, we always got uh, the information from the, from, from our uh, sports director who was in, in contact with the with the German Football League and then uh, it was um, we got the concept uh, we got the concept where the the final of the concept was the first game so and then we had 10 days uh, or it was when we got the information were two weeks it was Monday the 
um, in the beginning of May, and then we had two weeks to prepare for the first game. So, um, but we it it was like in Germany everywhere. Some clubs were already um, a few weeks in group trainings. Other clubs, like for example Werder Bremen in the first league, was still in uh, in home office. So um, it was very difficult to estimate the level level of the of the clubs um, and where where they will come back. So um, of course this brought us um, yeah un certainty and uh, for for us for the stuff but also for the players and we we focused on ourselves and tried to to prepare as good as possible and to focus on our principles to focus on our style of play and uh, the style of play didn't change um after corona times so um we tried to focus on us and and then see what happens in the first game so this was very difficult it's a very good question um but um the experience shows now that the Competition is very equal. Is very, is there are not that big differences, and uh, um, everything is almost as it was before. So, um, what's the feedback yeah. been like from your players? What's the feedback been like from playing in an empty stadium and from from in proper competition? Of course, not you know not practicing mm -hmm. in their own stadium to get ready mm -hmm. the actual competition of a league. Mm -hmm. So. I think um, the players were very glad that they, that we and everybody in the clubs were, were glad that we that we can play um, without fans. Of course, it is very sad um, that that uh, you play in an empty stadium, but um, yeah, the competition goes on, and that's very important for for football as itself. That that, that it can that the clubs can can work as uh, uh, in the future, um, for the employees in the, in the clubs, um, not the, the players, not the, not the staff, but for the for the normal employees, that was very important that we had the early restart, that they get their salary, uh, and yeah, that everything could be continued. Huh? That was that was very important, and yeah, the the, the players. Um, it took us a lot of um, conversations with the players. It took us a lot of energy to to. Um, yeah, to prepare them for the first for the first games. Um, for example, in the last week, we in the preparation and when we were in quarantine, we had uh, two training sessions before Kiel um, in the stadium to prepare for the atmosphere, to prepare for for um, everything um, how it will look like. We had an eleven versus eleven um, one week before the before the game um, with jerseys, so one white, one red, and. Um, Try to to make everything as close to as it will be in the first game. So this was our preparation, and uh, yeah, that was also the atmosphere. And then we, we when once we started to train eleven versus eleven um, in the when when physical contact was allowed again, then the players were like young rabbits, as I mm. when I can say that in English. They were chasing the ball. They were running. They were uh, like. Uh, Speedy Gonzalez. <laughs> yeah. Let's see with um, with yourself, Dean. Um, I mean, you're a little bit behind, and you're you're looking forward to going through these progressions. But what are what are the principles that you're looking at? What have you sort of what are the reference points you're using to design your training sessions to build up to that first game? So we. The manager Lee Johnson, he works to a tactical periodization model, and 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 that that's got to be fluid. I think normally within a season, when everything's set, that can be almost ticked off. You go that that day, right? We're going to do this, this, that, and, and you move it forward. Obviously, of course, we've not got the start date. We're hoping we've worked towards the thirteenth of June for a long time now, but that's probably going to become the twentieth. We hope, and we'll get some confirmation this week. We're slightly behind the English Premier League on that, but we'll see. But we have to be adaptable. What else can you do? You can't stick to a plan and, and then throw your arms in the air when things change. So for us, um, in terms of training, we, at the moment we're being guided purely by the regulations of the, of the EFL, which is the governing body, of course, for our division, for the government. So you know, we're working, as I say, looking forward to working tomorrow with groups of eight for the first time. Um, and then we structure our sessions around that. Uh, we're very much, as I said, are getting the units mixing together now. So it's you know it's it's important that the units, whether it's the back four or the midfield, are getting used again to working with each other. But we feel it's important as well to get units mixing as well. So as I said, there maybe a couple of centre halves, a couple of midfielders, and, and a couple of strikers and wipes. And we're changing them around. We we are lucky. We did 
think initially in lockdown that once we got the group of players of say eight players that I would be stuck with that group of eight players and I'm sure their eight players would, <laughs> wouldn't have liked that either um, but now we're able each session uh, so the group I'm working with tomorrow for example Monday you know I can work with a different group Monday so uh, sorry Tuesday so we're able to get our eyes on all the players between myself and, and the, two, the other two coaches and we feel as I say it's vital that we get the relationships with different units so we're being guided purely around that at the moment fine tuning of course, some of, some of the philosophy that we work towards, we've we spent, as a staff, we spent the first six weeks probably of lockdown looking at ourselves, so looking at our previous games this season, looking at, you know, from without the pressure of the next game in three days, it was, it was a bit easier to watch it back and to see certain things that were cropping up in games, little patterns and stuff that we could fine-tune. So then we started to turn it towards the opposition, we're hoping that the fixture schedule was going to continue as it was uh, previously so Blackburn away will be our first game and then and then we started to look at best practice so we started to look at teams like Liverpool who I feel as as hard as it is for me to say as a, someone from Manchester it's uh, they're the best team in Europe no no doubt about that in my mind at the moment so what is it that they are so special at and you know what the fascinating thing is they've got amazing players of course they've got a, the one of the best managers in the world Jurgen Klopp I would love to work for wow what a guy but in all of it the work rate and the willingness and the desire to run for each other uh, is the biggest thing in all of it. The way that they get like this in every single game, despite players changing positions and players coming in and out of the team, is an incredible thing to see. So, yeah, trying to take things from, from the best. Um, and, and as I say, waiting, it's, a, it's, a, it's been so long waiting for it. Uh, we just want to make sure that we get the preparation right, because as Sebastian just said there, the players are like fast rabbits, as he called it, but the, the, the staff are as well. Everyone's so keen and happy to be back. The sun's shining. It's a, and again, that's another thing, for, another challenge. We don't obviously normally play through June, July, August in England. Um, so we've got to get used to, again, them temperatures. So how long can you sustain that sort of aggressive front foot pressing without the ball and that relentless running in behind opposition? How, how long can you sustain that with three games a week with the potential heat problems that we're going to get? So again, we've got to look at all these things we are looking at all these things. We're trying to prepare for every eventuality and hopefully nothing will catch us, uh, catch us by surprise. But hopefully on the back of this, I can at least maybe get Sebastian's phone number and I can <laughs> maybe stay in touch and get a few more, a few more yeah. secrets off the record. Maybe it'd be great. Oh, yeah. absolutely. We're going to get Sebastian to give away one or two more secrets on the record now. Um, I know I'm chatting to both of you uh, and from what you've said this evening that both sets of players you work with are, in terms of fitness... They're, like, they're bang on it. You, you know, you've got no qualms about where their fitness levels are in terms of how you're progressing them. But the one area was in terms of the technical abilities coming back, the sort of spatial awareness. And I wonder, Sebastian, where the, yeah, the sort of things you were working on that once you got back to 11 and the 11, whether you can sort of share yeah, how you kind of work that and get players feeling confident about playing again. Yeah, yeah. Um... So when we had the, the first conversations um, with, the, with the players after the first experiences when they were playing football again, so um, it was like uh, they, they suffered with, uh, with the space and with the, the cognitive things uh, way more than, uh, than with physical things. So, um, and then we, then we tried to focus on, again, on, on the football aspect um, that we practice as much of what we couldn't in the in the weeks before um so games dwells contact again and to refresh um in the mind but also on our principles um the principles that we um stand for and uh, that we have in the four phases like uh in defending in the possession in the transition moments and uh, as what i what i said here the space the opponents and the time pressure was um, the most challenging for the players because um, they didn't play normal football. Um, they haven't played normal football for yeah, two and a half months, and um, that's the reason why we why we started to started to um, play with bigger numbers. Um, in this overview, you can see um, the last nine days um, before we before we um, started um, against Kiel again. So we wanted to, to play in bigger numbers at the beginning. So getting used to football, our playing style, feed the desire, I call it. Um, so the, the, the wish to play football again, to, to get that. And we started with longer intervals. So 
three minutes um, playing time. Uh, normally during the season, we focus on on shorter times, and then we have, were in quarantine camp and played in smaller numbers. So more physical contacts, more uh, repetitions, and everything until we came over to the 11 versus 11 um, input, and that was our guideline. So so and our guideline was not like a master plan it was like, just like um what sounded logically um for us um what sounded on a yeah what um what could make sense um how we can can bring in the best performance for the players in the first game of course we used also data that we had from the last games before from the last uh, training sessions in uh, before the lockdown and yeah this was our our um orientation for for the intensity, um, how we how we could regulate it in the after the after the lockdown and when we were uh, in team trainings again, so that's that were our guidelines, so to say. Okay, yeah, thanks, Sebastian. Yeah, um, yeah. Dean, I know as a group, um, you've been kind of looking at the path back to playing and trying to anticipate little problems that you may have to face along the way. Um, is that one of the things that you looked at? That sort of how do we re get the players sort of spatial awareness back when we're always sort of restricted in terms of the numbers we can work with? Yeah, again, I think one of the things we've done, uh, certainly the support staff have been focusing heavily on is, is predictable problems that we're going to face and not being caught cold by them. So being proactive rather than reacting to them. So trying to come up with as many, and we've come to, we've got about 35, I think, at the moment of predictable problems that the players may face. That'll be you know, going into the first game. That'll be, um, you know, the uncertainty around things like getting changed in different dressing rooms and the whole, really, the whole match day being completely different from getting changed in your kit to going home in your same kit without showering and just all daft stuff like that. Not to say daft stuff, but maybe small things. But to certain people, they could, of course, be, be big things which would keep them up at night. So we're trying to sort of nail them down so that if they do occur, we, you know, we're in a position to maybe deal with them as, you know, as quick as we can. The spatial awareness thing is something that we, it's one of the principles that we focus heavily on um, pre-lockdown. So um, we met a guy called Gear Jordet, I think his name is, Scandinavian guy. And he's, you might have seen him on YouTube. You might have seen him on YouTube. For, no, is he playing for Hanover? No, no, he, he's, he's, an old, he's an older guy, Sebastian. Oh, okay. He's on YouTube. You might have seen the clip. Mm. There's a famous clip a few years ago with Frank Lampard and the camera was mm. focused okay. purely on Lampard. And I think he, he scanned something like 35 yeah. times in yeah. 10 seconds. Yeah. It was, and we, we, we managed to find out. Anyway, we got him across to Bristol and, and we had a couple of hours with him. And it was the most fascinating. And he, he started like 20 years ago with his own video camera in the stand, mm. with his own, paid for his own ticket. And he would sit there and focus on one play for the, of course, now they've got different technology and it becomes easier. But um, So he gave us quite a few good ideas around ways, purely from a simple passenger, where it's all about technique, really. Not so much maybe tactical, but a lot of technique involved in a simple passenger before training. We've introduced spatial awareness within that now. So the players are constantly scanning. And it's not just... <laughs> one of the things we found um, when we started to video is a lot of players were, were scanning so much because that's what the coach told them to. They weren't taking the information in. So uh, we've used the VR, v, v, not VAR, the VR um, last season, a company called, I think they're called My Hyper. Um, again, where you're able to stick the headset on and, and, and you've got all these sort of things coming in from different angles. And again, a real test for the, uh, for the players. So that's something that we focused heavily on. So we're hoping that that, that won't be an issue, of course. <laughs> Next Monday, when we do the first 11 v 11, you know, I might be laughing to myself if we do see people running into each other and stuff. Hopefully not. Hopefully not, no. But um, yeah, I imagine there'll still be a little bit of where it's a little bit off. But, but I guess, Sebastian, I don't know whether when you've noticed that sort of level of, okay, the players are not quite back to where they were. Is it something that you're used to seeing in kind of like a pre-season situation when they've been away for maybe three, four weeks and then coming back for pre-season? Or was it a little bit different to that? Um, I think it's, it's um, not to compare at all because, um, because we were at the end of the season, actually, when the lockdown came. So we started in June 2019 and, uh, and the lockdown came in March, so 2020. And, uh, and we were at the end of the season. So... The, the guys knew each other. We didn't have to make any 
team building because uh, we were we had a had a good team. So that's one one typical one important aspect of a of a preseason, I think. And according to to physical abilities or to tactical abilities, um, we we had had our principles how we want to play football. And um, according to physicality, um, we um, I think that the home office and the group training session made us much better in uh, physical terms because we did way more runs than we would do during the season or in a, in a, in a pre-season because um, yeah, players came fit into the lockdown and out of the lockdown. So, and the phase of home office was only um, three weeks. Um, so um, I don't think that uh, pre-season is comparable to to this phase now and uh yeah um this showed us also the results of of the first of the data of the first games we're sort of looking ahead to to playing again dean um you don't have a start date but you do know what teams you'll be playing and in what order so i'm you know, just trying to get into that sort of multidisciplinary angle and what sort of work you're doing with your analysis guys to understand Right. These are, you, these are the things that we can expect from. I mean, I don't know how how deep are you going with that, knowing that right things may be different. Are you are you basing it on everything that has happened before lockdown, or with some games you're going to wait and see and and take your analysis on how those teams are performing post lockdown. Yeah. I think one of the biggest things for us will be a normal preseason. You play three, probably five, six, seven games against local opposition and then build build up the yeah. competition of course we're not going to be able to do yeah. that so 11 11 in house is going to be that's also a very good point yeah, yeah. totally different <laughs> yeah it's going to be really really interesting for us but on the analysis side yeah what we've done is we used the lockdown um, as wisely as we could so we at the very outset we we had a, a big staff zoom meeting and and we literally delegated roles for for, for an al uh, analyst for sports science and all the rest of it. and we all pulled together so what we've done is we've got nine, game, nine league games remaining. Hopefully, there'll be uh, two playoff semi-finals and a playoff final at the end of that. But certainly for the nine league games, we've, we've prepared the analysis already. So we've done that, of course, based on how these teams have played before. So Blackburn away, our first game. Um, we've prepared all the analysis on that, on the set pieces and, and the, with and without the ball. Blackburn might decide in lockdown, Tony Mowbray's a very experienced, great manager. He might have decided that he wants to tweak his system. He wants to change style of play. It might be a couple of players that are, we, we've we probably benefited from getting one of our long-term injury, Benny Kofobi, who got a cruise shot, unfortunately, but he's hopefully going to be fit now, whereas he wouldn't have been fit previously. So there's, what we've done is we've, we've looked at every club and we've prepared for that game. And then obviously once the season restarts and these teams start playing, we'll, we'll, we'll be watching all the games we've got now else to do. And um and then if we need to tweak, you know, if a certain team plays a different style, we can tweak it rather than starting from afresh. Um, so what we did, one of the things we did, we spoke to quite a few. So we spoke to people like Chris Coleman, who was the, he was the Wales manager in Euro 2016, who was an unfancy team who got to the semi-finals. Amazing story. We spoke to, to Paul Simpson, who was the England under-20s coach when they won the, the World Cup three years ago. I think it was in Korea, I think. So we spoke to them guys about what they did because we're going, similar to Sebastian, into a nine-game. Uh, I don't know how long it'll be, 40, 45, 50 days. It's almost like a, like a tournament. Uh, so that, you know, that, there's a lot of work to get through in terms of analysis. Uh, the, the coaches are nowadays, the younger breed, are, you know, quite into the sports code. And I, for one, love to sort of watch. I'll get information from our analysts, but I like to watch it with my own set of eyes sometimes. So I can click the game myself and, and get my own feel for it and then go and speak to them about, cause, about what they've seen. So, we are prepared in that scenario, as I say, but it, it may change as, as... And again, that's one of the things which is interesting and exciting. Yeah, I mean, think, you, uh, um, yeah, sorry. No, I, I think you're about to say what I was about to ask you. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> crack on. Okay. Um, one thing um, is very interesting, Dean said, um, we, we don't have uh, friendly matches or test matches. So, um, But we, we had the, the data... Um, we have from from the league from the league matches so um and we are using using the same system also after the lockdown so um we could compare um the data from from a match before in training sessions in groups 
for example, in physical terms. So um, we, knew, we, we knew how how much the players run in distance, total distance. We know the decelerations, the accelerations, the sprints and everything. And it's not that easy, but we try to imitate that in the weeks, in the group training weeks, that we create exercises where the players have competitions and came to the same or similar amount of, of distances and sprints, accelerations, decelerations. So, um, of course, it doesn't have to do anything with spatial awareness or anything like that, but um, we could, uh, yes, we could use the data um, to, to get the physical, um, the, the physical, uh, yeah, data from a match uh, also in a training session so maybe this this could help um for the for the group training phase yeah 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 that's that's something we'll be looking to do as you say to replicate the match so that the players mm. physically know that they can yeah. they can go to where they need to go to physically i think the only difference in that is of course the, it's a little bit like practicing penalties i suppose in training yeah. it's when that match day comes yeah, around and of course yeah. the butterflies in the stomach yeah. you know, kick in and yeah. no um, then I have another question on you. Um, um, how um, how many people do you have in your staff, and how did you did you um, yeah share your um, your um, for example did you did you have um, certain projects um, for you for your for the other assistant and what what was the role of the head coach was he also on the pitch or was it just um, um, managing everything. Um, what was it look? Did it look like? So we've our, our scenario. We've got Lee Johnson, who's the head coach, and then below that there's m myself and Jamie McAllister, who are two assistant head coaches. Mm -hmm. I'm primarily in charge of the attacking set pieces. Jamie's okay. in charge of the defensive set pieces. Okay. Uh, so I hope we, you score a lot. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a competition between the two of us all the time. Yeah, okay. He's, okay. I'm from England. He's Scottish <laughs> as well, so there's a big competition yeah. between us. But um, and we reg we would normally then take the post match meeting with the players on a Monday morning or you know mm. match day plus two. We would normally take the, the meeting. We we'll go through the clips yeah. with the manager, and, and sometimes the manager will take it. But more often than not, be me or Jamie. But Lee's a coach that likes to be on the grass with the players. He's a, he's a head coach. He loves to coach. So it, it changes around, Sebastian. One day, Lee might take everything and myself and Jamie will support him and, and help to set up the equipment and, and just support him and coach the players yeah. Yeah. Uh, privately. And then other days, it might yeah. be that myself and Jamie will share the whole workload. One day, I might take mm -hmm. everything. Uh, so we mix it around like that. So I think we're quite lucky that we, that we get a, a big exposure to yeah. lots of different scenarios, okay. whether that's preparing okay. the day before yeah. the game, whether that's... Yeah. An interesting group I always find is yeah. the match day plus one when you've got the group training that have not started the game the day before, uh, dealing with the mental. And unfortunately, when I was a player, I was in that group probably more often than not. So uh, understanding okay. the uh, psychological problems that they might be going through, not not always in the team, but as you said, yeah. they've got to train. They've got to hit the physical levels that they yeah. so that when they're called upon by the manager, they're ready to go into the team and be, and be ready. Yeah. You know? Okay, yeah. Sometimes you don't always yeah. get there. You don't always get a big warning. It could be two hours before kickoff. Someone gets injured, bang, mm. you're in the team. So, yeah, uh, we've got a great group. We've got a fantastic, yeah. first and foremost, a fantastic group of people, both in the playing okay. and the coaching okay. staff. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. And we've, we've been um, in the club for four years now. So that's took a while to get to that. But mm. we're feeling a good. Uh, in our situation, it was it was similar. So so our head coach um, did a lot during during this time and uh, um, was. Um, uh, also always on the pitch and he, he loves coaching and uh, but um, for such a special situation I think uh, communication is, is, is very important um, to to find find good solutions for for this situation because nobody has ever experienced something like that before and uh, and uh, but we also had um, in the stuff uh, individual projects so for example my project was to create um, individual um, summary videos for development videos for the players so um based on strength and weaknesses um for what they what they showed us in uh, in the season and uh yeah and our, our video analyst and um, prepared all the all the following matches so that we are not in not struggling when we have for example like it was the last week uh, three three games in six days so yeah but you're much more used to <laughs> yeah. to this yeah. So we're starting to get a few questions coming through on what the uh, 
match day environment looks like? I know you alluded to one or two things earlier, Dean, but sort of maybe I'll uh, ask Sebastian and sort of maybe pick on one or two things that in terms of the whole routine, doesn't matter how dry it is, like Dean says, just in terms of travelling to games, how you get changed at games, what are the big differences are just in that aspect away from up the pitch? Um, this was my question, no? Yeah, yes. must be like that because um, I show you something um, again. We, um, as you know, we had a we got a fifty pages concept of the of the German football league, and this was um, yeah, there was a lot in there, a lot of content, a lot of information, and. The first thing was we had to get familiar with this concept um, to explain it to the players to to um, figure out for them because no player I can can imagine that a football player is sitting down and reading a five pages um, concept so we had to figure out the most important points of it and explain it to the players what it means for their everyday life so and all the points you can see here is um, it was about the stadium match day procedure. Um, TV uh, production, of course, that's not that important for us, but also the hotels, away trips, um, training centers, and also for the rules for players and staff at home um, were in there. And I give you some the, the most crucial um, examples. For example, we are in separated changing rooms in a, in a training center, also in the stadium. So maximum five players in one room. Um, we have to wear masks. I, I don't know if you saw the TV pictures of the of the matches um, when the substitutes are on the stands and not on the bench, um, where the, the the where you can't hold the 1.5 meter distance. And we we also the staff um, only the head coach is the one who doesn't have to wear a mask uh, during the during the game. And if we want to coach, we have to put it up like this, and then we can shout. Um, yeah. Bigger buses or more buses, but the 1.5 meter distance is the rule. And uh, of course, no physical contact at goal celebration. And uh, uh, when you when you say hello to the opponents, it's not possible. And uh, yeah, that's also an interesting point here. Um, we have testings, Corona testings, twice a week. The rules are it has to be one day before the match and uh, five days. Um, our maximum in between two tests, so um, that's really um, really much testing. And uh, at home, we are told that we should not have public contacts and no visits. And yeah, at the end, it's six spots in our lives until the end of the season. That's at home, training center, stadium, team bus, hotels, and if necessary, the supermarket. If you're not alone in your in your flat, and uh, that's um, some, these are some examples of of the guidelines. And uh, yeah, the players are more than more than uh, disciplined, more than um, know the responsibility they have. And uh, yeah, we see us as a as a role model um, for for other countries, and we are um, doing our best that it works out because. If it doesn't work out, then yeah, it will stop the processes in, in other countries as well, I think. Um, yes, I think that's uh, very likely. I mean, Dean, yeah. I don't know if you've been given similar sort of guidelines on that sort of level yet, or are you still waiting to get an idea of what a match day and what the players' responsibilities will be once you start playing again? Yeah, we're just waiting to find out the actual formalities of match day. I think uh, one of the guys in our support staff is uh, he's liaising with the EFL, so he's privy to some, quite a lot of information and, and indeed taking part and actually learning from other countries like yourself. So you're doing a great job over there, Sebastian. I have to say it's uh, no pressure, <laughs> but we're, uh, we're we're enjoying watching the games again. And no, but yeah. we but in, in Germany happen also some some cases you you might uh, might have seen in the press um, where. It was not that good, like uh, the Kalu the Kalu video uh, on yeah. Facebook. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um, we, yeah, we know there are more than thousand people involved. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Hopefully, hope for the best. 
I think for, for I think for us, Steve, on that we've just had to, and, and we have become used to it now. To testing, the testing is not nice either. <laughs> I have to say, we're twice a week. Um, the training ground, there's there's a lot of work gone into that. It's it's a shared facility. We're having our brand our own brand new training ground built on site, which will be ready hopefully by maybe Christmas time. But at the moment, it's a shared facility, so you can imagine the amount of cleaning that's had to go into it and and, and all that type of stuff. So. Now we've had to part, set the car park up so there's three spots between players. You have to go round to the pitches sort of one way around. The, and when you leave the pitches, you have to go the opposite way and, and, and all stuff like that, really, that the players have adhered to. Um, but the hardest thing, really, is in training, I think, even with a small group, Sebastian, where you, you're coaching from afar and you find yourself getting a little bit closer and then there's equipment all around and certain people can't touch the equipment. And you know, normally you might say to someone, can you just grab that mannequin and move it? And there's just all just getting used to it. It's like anything. Nobody likes yeah. change. No, uh, no. But everybody's been very professional, I have yeah. to say. And, uh, um, there is also an experience of mine um, over the last uh, weeks when, when testing started. So over the phase when there was no testing yet, um, yeah, we felt like, um, okay, everything is a little bit uncertain. Um, is everybody healthy? But when once testing started, um, we were much more safe that nothing can go wrong so to say so this gives us a lot of lot of um security yeah 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 i would agree with that yeah. i mean that's a, a big thing i mean you're in the performance business and nothing affects performance like anxiety it's understandable that there's a lot of anxiety amongst your players at this moment in time um how do you manage that dean it's, it's something I have a huge passion for. I think it, it starts with building relationships, I think, from um, even before, forget lockdown for a minute, it's getting to know the people you work with. It's, it's understanding what the world is like through their eyes, I suppose, where they've come from, what's the story, what was their upbringing, um, who they support, trying to get little things like that so you can get a common ground with a player. Um, and then I think more so now, in, particularly in this period at the moment, I think, you know, everybody talks a lot about culture and environment and that's not just about sticking a slogan on the wall. I think you can go into some buildings and some workplaces, you can't see the the, the paint on the walls for slogans and pictures. And, and that's great, but it comes down to looking after your people and treating them with respect and caring for them, as I say, and no, no more so than in, than in the current predicament. So um, it's something that we, we cater for a lot at our football club. We've got a obviously sports psychologist, wellness, all that type of thing. And, and ultimately, you can't probably uh, prepare for everything. There's, things are going to crop up at any point with any player. And I think the more you can get to know the player, the trust is everything. I spoke before about communication. Uh, once you can get that trust with someone and, and you can get that relationship, then you'd like to think that you know, things can get ironed out a little bit smoother. So uh, as I say there, there's things that we're going into around matches, travelling. Uh, we've got... Um, our first journey for those that, that not uh, know the geography of England for, for our first journey our first game is probably going to be a, probably a four hour car journey so we're going to it's something that we were not we were, we were lucky previously we would have flown up there but we're now going to have to take coaches and, and will we have to go in two coaches three coaches will we have to arrive at certain times and again it's just getting I think that first match day will be huge as you said there for the anxiety because be the players will be putting the red on the pillow at the night thinking, am I going to be ready for this first game? What's it going to be like without a crowd? Um, all this noise uh, going yeah, off between it, the air, so. it was It was really a special experience because um, yeah, everybody was, was more uh, excited than, than, than before. And uh, yeah, like, like, uh, the, ten the level of tension was, was higher. In terms of leading up to that first game, Sebastian, and how did you did you do anything to help prepare the players for playing in a an empty stadium? Um, yeah, we had the the training sessions um, in the stadium. Uh, we had one week before the game, the eleven versus eleven, uh, in internal, and uh, we also had the the last two training sessions before the game. In the stadium, and uh, we made them familiar with um, how everything will will be. So, so there was a there was a information um, from the from the sports director who who told us um, that the substitutes uh, will be on the stands, and 
um, how it is with the changing rooms and how it is with the with the lineups and um, yeah so we were informed very well um, on the on the regulations and this was the main preparation in organizational terms in football terms um, yeah we we told the players that we can make much more use of of um, talking to each other on the pitch on the pitch because um, on a normal game the the goalkeeper can't shout to the striker because he can't hear him or also for us as coaches we can we can uh, bring much more information from the outside to the players and we we um, wanted the players to make use of this and that was one major point and um, yeah that we we can use um, we can use loud shouting to for our for our pressure to to impress the opponent so because everybody can hear everything and once um, if there are no fans so we have to do it on our own <laughs> and that we wanted to to use all the subs um, and the, the players who are not in the squad but understand um, also the the, the employees um, from the who are from our club in the stadium uh, were um, yeah were allowed to 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 support us on the on the pitch so better 100 people than no people at all. <laughs> I mean, there's a, a lot of interesting things there to, to go at, Dean. I think one interesting point I have that a lot of talk around coronavirus is about restrictions and things you can't do. But Sebastian sort of then picked up on one or two things that actually now these are things that you can do. Now players can actually hear each other on the pitch. And I think as you mentioned before, you're not going to have the, the sound of 20,000 Bristolians creating that momentum for you in the coming weeks. The players are going to have to do that themselves. Have you been doing much of working around that and, and how, yeah, between them, that's communication and, and being able to build momentum in games? Yeah, and that, you're right. That's a huge thing for us at Ashton Gate is, is that home support has been massive for us. And of course, we're going to have to make do without that now. I'm sure that the fullbacks and the wide players will be happy because they're the two in a normal scenario that would get, be constantly getting pulled across by the coaches <laughs> to pass the message on and, and all that. So, yeah, we try to be creative. We, we, again, I said at the beginning, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, we, we're trying to make the players as familiar as they can with the surroundings. And other than that, it's, it's a game of football. The rules are the same. You know, you're good, athletic, professional footballers. You know the way that we play. You know, go and, go and do it like that, I suppose. But, yeah, there's little things that we've tried with, off, the, off the pitch. We've tried with, I think it was out in Australian Rugby League, they've looked at ways of getting some... Uh, some noise into the stadium through the speakers and trying to replicate if there's a if there's an attack at goal, trying to replicate the noise of of what that would sound like in in a stadium, um, and certain hand gestures because I think as Sebastian just said there, of course we can we can shout information from the outside and the players can talk from within, but most of the time the, the opposition will be able to hear that as well. Um, so certain hand gestures that we're trying to work towards to, you know, to certain things and because as I said before, momentum is a huge thing in football. And that's the most interesting thing for me within all this coronavirus football is that, you know, sometimes when you can just feel the crowd driving a team on and you and you wanting the whistle to stop, how do you sometimes stop the game? Do you do do you do you get an injury or does something happen where you can just stop the flow of the momentum? So, mm. um, yeah, we're looking at all these things. As I said, but as I say, we're trying to keep the players as calm as possible and and trying to make them feel that it's as normal as possible in the most abnormal circumstances. There is also one one um, new thing. Um, we have five uh, substitutes now, um, who who can we can bring in, and for example, um, I am also organizing um, the, the the set pieces during during the game. So when you have five changes on the one side, five five changes on the other side, um, that's a huge um, yeah huge change in the organization. And uh, there it helps a lot um, that you can not pass the information, only the player who comes in um, or give him a, a small piece of paper or anything like that. So you can make the use of shouting um, in the situation and uh, organize, um, organize it a little, little better then because, yeah, that's, um, that's a new challenge. Uh, in, has been a new challenge in these games now. Yeah, that's that's huge pressure normally when the opposition are making a change and you're trying to get yeah. information onto your yeah. his centre half that he's got to change. Yeah. His, you know, yeah. yeah, again, st certain strategies around that. Mm. Um, yeah, on that um, question on Chi from Chi, um, 
So yeah, we'll start with you, Dean, with this one. Um, again, on the sub substitution, yeah. How is that going to affect your match preparations? The fact that now you've got five subs, although you're only allowed to make it in three changes. Um, yeah, it is. It affects it. Um, it affects the game because um, you have uh, the rule is. Um, I repeat it um, quickly. Um, you have three um, uh, three uh, options to to use the the change, but the half time is not one of the three. Um, so, for example, if if you have a player with a yellow card, um, you're more likely to to change him in half time um, to go no risk and. Uh, or you you can bring in two um, fresh players uh, at once. For example, for example, if the if the central midfielders are tired in this uh, after the after the the special phase of the lockdown and uh, only can go um, for seventy minutes, then you can bring in two central strikers. Of course, you can do that with three changes, but um, you are not doing that yeah, regularly. So. Um, that's how we can affect it, and uh, yeah, the and that we also um, have more uh, influence on on tactical changes and individual changes, and yeah, it's also a good thing for the players because um, you can um, drop off the players who who are tired and bring in uh, yeah fresh new ones, and they have more hope that they come in. <laughs> I mean, on that, Dean, is it something you've been preparing for? And obviously, maybe in the first couple of games, it might be a case that you use it just as part of load management. Or will you be very much dictated to by what happens in a game and, and we'll react to that rather than have any pre-planned that, OK, maybe these are one or two players we may look to change at half-time or 60 minutes? I think it's a really good question. That is something that provokes a lot of dialogue with, within our coaching staff. Um, I think the biggest challenge within that is, is sometimes too many options can, can be a problem as well. So the fact that you've now got five subs available, all of a sudden, after 55, 60 minutes, it's not quite going the way that you thought it was going to pan out. All of a sudden, it's, it's, it, you, know, you might be looking to things where I was normally, obviously, in a normal scenario. So, yeah, it's an, again, I think it's a, it's a wise rule change, I think, in the scenario. Uh, teams and players won't be used to playing this amount of games so from a well-being perspective I think it's a good option to have um, yeah again for us we work towards the way that we think games are going to pan out we have uh, strategies before the game of you know certain substitutions at a certain point in the game to maybe change the style slightly depending on the results so yeah that'll just give us more options as I say and, and, and a, another good thing in it is it, it keeps you know the players on the outside of the eleven. It keeps them even more motivated because obviously normally there's there's less places up for grabs, and this, you know, this is a way that uh, keeps everybody feeling that they're part of something. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, starting to get a few questions coming in about the, the match performances. Um, before I specifically go to those, I suppose we'll go to Sebastian, and we sort of talked about that anticipation of the first game. You've played that first game, so it'd probably be interesting for us all to know, like in terms of the output levels of your players, how did they compare in the first game back against Kiel, I believe, compared to say your last game before lockdown? Yeah, um, it was uh, the data were, were, was very interesting. Um, so um, I can show you something. Um, based on the data. Uh, we've made a comparison um, from the last match, what was on the 7th of March, um, two and a half months almost um, um, afterwards the, the, the match against Kiel. So it were similar matches. The, the opponents had more possession, more ball possession than we had. Um, we, we lost 2-1 against Hamburg and we draw 2-2 against Kiel. But if you compare where I made the um, the signs, um, we had almost the same total distance in running. We had after the Corona outbreak, um, after the break. Um, so I haven't got the numbers in English, but Anzal means numbers. Numbers of sprints was higher than it was before the break, and also the distance of uh, sprints in kilometers was higher than it was before. So this is very interesting data for us. 
um, that it's not clear um, that that uh, the players are not that fit and not that um, able in physical terms um, afterwards. So we had the fact was that we had more sprints and more tempo runs after the break, and this made us very very glad. Um, and uh, also, if I pick out two individual players, like this is a a left back and this is a striker. Um, you can also see that we that the left back offensive runs um, 14 before and 28 afterwards. So that's a um, bigger number. And uh, the striker also had had a good distance in running. For example, these were um, 99 minutes. We had here for 94 minutes, and he made a bigger distance. Of course, distance in kilometer is not a, an incidence for for quality, but um, he for us, it's important to see that also after the outbreak, the players um, have the ability to go um, and to, 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 to go the distances, to do the sprints and to do the acceleration. So um, that was the, 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 the main thing for us and that they are able. Of course, the data was not that good. Um, after the third game in six days, so they were the numbers were a little bit lower, but um, yeah, that would also happen uh, maybe in a in a normal season. I think Dean has has the experience in this terms. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess for, for for you, Dean, I suppose it's encouraging to see numbers like that. That what Sebastian from training and what they were measuring before lockdown is. It's shown itself in a game that I guess everyone would be nervous going into that first game, but to sort of see that with Regensburg and across the Bundesliga that players have maintained certainly the physical fitness levels in their first games back. Yeah, I'm sure that gives the, the players and the, and the staff actually huge confidence because, as I say, these are unprecedented times that the numbers are uh, showing us that our players are really fit, so we expect the, the numbers to be probably similar than that. I mean, that's that. that there's a lot of credit there goes to the the, uh, the professionalism of the players, really, uh, and the staff to make sure they keep them motivated and keep them fit because it is difficult to to, to maintain that when you when you don't know about the the designated start time. So yeah, I think there's a lot of credit goes to a lot of people involved in that, not more so than the players. But um, I think the big part of that then is that then the recovery and, and you talked there previously about the amount of subs you can use. You know, you've really got to start to really start to think smartly about how you how you use your subs and and the recovery recovery strategies that you can use because you know, that's a huge outlay for for a player to then yeah. go again yeah. sort of three days later, isn't it? Yeah. Can you can you give us um, some insights or uh, some strategies um, how you how you recover during a uh, Weeks like when you play on Saturday, play again on on Tuesday or Wednesday, and again the next weekend. And what are your strategies um, in the days in between? So, let's say you have a match on Saturday, um, next match on Tuesday, and then again on Friday or or Saturday. What a uh, what does that week look like? So the, typically the Sunday would be a rest day. But sometimes depending on the, the game that's just happened and the game that's about to come on the Tuesday, we might. And be the rest the day means the players are not on the we'll training ground. They're be off. Yeah. Uh, okay. Off. Okay. We, we've we've played around with that in the last four years. Uh, we went through a period of time where we got the players in on the Sunday and then we gave them the Sunday off and got them in maybe on the Tuesday morning prior to the evening game and we played around with it and I think the biggest thing in all of it is the Sunday is a great day for the players to spend with the families. Um, of course, they can come to the training ground and do some recovery strategies, but you know, we trust the players that we've got. They're very professional. Uh, and and we can do you give them, them, them some programs, for example, that they are recovery runs or stretching or anything like that? I was going to say, we can also keep an eye on them due to modern technology. So um, we think it works well. It works for us. Um, yeah, the recovery strategy starts immediately following the game. So, of course, straight away, you've got the food, you've got the, uh, the ice baths, and, and we've got... a we're lucky we've got a cryotherapy unit. I say lucky, not, it's not very pleasant to go into it, but we've got the cryotherapy unit at the training ground. So, yeah, um, I think the biggest thing for me, the sleep and, the, and the, the nutrition is the biggest part of any recovery, I believe. There's lots mm. of things you can facilitate, but they're the two biggest things. Um, mm. So we face a huge challenge a lot where we'll be playing away on a Tuesday night, maybe four or five hours drive away from Bristol and we get back to Bristol yeah. at 
three o'clock in the morning. Uh, do you then get the players in on that Wednesday at ten o'clock lunchtime for a for an ice bath when you see, let them sleep, let them get their natural recoveries? Um, yeah. So then, the, 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 so the Sunday would normally be off after the Saturday game, and then the Monday will be uh, will be post match analysis, and then and sometimes start a little bit later to give them a bit more sleep in that morning, um, and then it will be usually then the group will come down that have started the game and go again depending on we've got to get with. <laughs> You play that many Saturday Tuesday games, you've got to quickly put the Saturday game to bed and focus on the Tuesday. So it's a, it could be a completely different game. You might play a team like Fulham, who uh, are like Man City, where they enjoy sixty-five percent possession and seven hundred yeah. passes in a game, and then you might yeah. go on three days later against a team that are very, very direct in the way that they play. And it's a completely different scenario. So a lot of tactical work has got to be put into the players, but you don't want to overload them physically. So we try to do that with a video, of course. And, and uh, I don't know if you have in Germany, do you know what the word Sabutio is, Steve, in Germany? I know what Sabutio is. Probably, it's, yeah. probably the same, it's probably the same name. It's a, a word. What is it? Sabutio. Table, it's table football where you, where you flick it. I'm describing Sabutio to okay. a German. Okay. Really. I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't know. It's basically not necessarily a cultural thing, Dean. I think it's an age thing. I think it's yeah, maybe, a little bit younger maybe, than You might be right. My dad got me into that. <laughs> oh, wow. What, I used to have the little stadium around the pitch. I painted it. Oh, Oh, amazing. Anyway, <laughs> Sebastian, it's a, it's, a tactic, it's a tactics board, but instead of being like this with the magnets, it's, it's flat yeah. on a table and it's little physical players with a ball. So it's, it's a great visual for okay. a player to be able okay. to see. And, okay. you know, we do yeah. a lot. We do a lot. Maybe on, you can write the word down in the, te- in the chat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we do a lot on, on, on trying to get the players to, to own the, their own performance as well. So mm-hmm. rather than the coaching staff always telling them what they're going to do all the time. We try and get their, their ownership and, and their leadership within that. So it encourages conversations with the players where they can stand around the Sabutio board and they can move players around and talk with units and, and, and relationships on the pitch. So, mm-hmm. yeah, we, um, uh, we've got a real good, um, we've got a real good results this year from um, soft tissue injuries and, mm-hmm. and the player, we, we pride ourselves on our fitness. Yeah. You know, our team are very, very fit. So, you know okay. the recovery strategies. I said the professionals. And are, are you are you playing, for example, eleven versus versus no opponents um, in in tactical terms that you are uh, um, combining this with recovering and uh, slow slow shifting? Yeah. Of, of, yeah. Of again, it's a, yeah. yeah. Again, it's a good way to. And sometimes eleven v eleven, but just it's very passive, so mm-hmm. it still gives a little bit of a of a problem to solve, but. You know, obviously, you stick in, a lot. Yeah, yeah, you stick yeah. the mannequins in the ground. You see, anyone can beat a team of mannequins, can't they? Or they shouldn't mm. be able to. So, yeah. you're right. It's a good way, maybe po- uh, match day plus two, of of getting some tactical ideas into the players in a real slow moving okay. uh, scenario. Yeah. Okay. And are you doing some activations like uh, like uh, sprinting activations uh, in in an, in that close uh, close gap, or are you doing some uh, some yeah? small-sided games for a really short time to, to bring them up again? Yes. So, again, we've, we've tried different methods. And what, the one we've come to round two now is myself and Jamie and Lee, we're all lucky enough to be ex-players. So, you, you sometimes go off your own experience as well. So, on a Monday morning now after the meeting, um, particularly after a poor result or a poor performance, we, we just get the players on the ball again, enjoying the football. Okay. We're not thinking too much. So, yeah, small-sided yeah. game is a, is a great example of a way to do that yeah. so the players all of a sudden are just they're like kids in the playground again they're playing football and enjoying it then we'll break off and then go into the tactical work so um, again it's each to their own I suppose that's the way that we've found okay. and we're not just regimented we don't stick to that every single time yeah yeah and and uh, when you have when you are on Tuesday um, match day uh, you play for example at seven in the evening and or even later or earlier, I don't know. Um, do you have a training session in the morning? It's always a seven forty-five kickoff or eight pm kickoff in England. But no, no. Again, two. I think two seasons ago, we 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 tried that idea, and we spoke to the players. We get their feedback, and and a lot of the feedback was that they're having to come in in the morning and then train and then go home, mm. and it messes around with the different things. So yeah, we we like to think we get our preparation done on the within the Sunday or the Monday, and the players are fresh ready to okay. come in on the, on the Tuesday. They always report for a home game 
they would report for a pre-match meal sort of three hours before kickoff. So okay. Okay. at that point, we're able to do team meetings and, and speak to mm -hmm. the players one-to-one -to, -one to get a feel mm -hmm. about it. So actually only one training session. Yeah. All right, thank you. I think alluding to that, Sebastian, I mean, you had your game on Tuesday evening and then having to travel to Osnabrück. And what was yeah. the preparation for that? What did that look like? And I suppose the interesting side. Yeah, um, um, you had a stopover in a, you stayed overnight in a hotel or you just traveled yes. straight to the game? Um, no, we, we faced Nuremberg on Tuesday evening. And of course, then we had food after the game and uh, doing the first uh, recovery methods. And then on, uh, on Wednesday, we had uh, a recovery training session in the morning. And uh, for the players who played against Nuremberg, um, they only were only doing 20 minutes of recovery runs. And uh, then they, they went home again. But we were also on the pitch with the substitutes who made a, made a yeah, um, short uh, training session for them and then uh, on thursday we had a tactical um, training session but very short and um, only um, showing the yeah how we expect osnabrück to play and doing some tactical shifting and then um, that that's it some set pieces and then we went off the pitch and went into the bus um, in the morning on thursday then we had a seven hours ride to to Osnabrück and then we played on, on Friday, Friday evening. And, um, and that's the reason for my question. We were, when we have um, evening games, we were always um, going on pitch um, in the morning. So 10, 10, 30, around that. And uh, doing some, some uh, yeah, little sweating, <laughs> like uh, playing six, seven versus two in the middle, um, something like that, um, some mobility, strength uh stretching exercises something like that yeah and yeah just if you dean i mean you have a probably not too many uh eight hour boat um bus rides in the championship but um in terms of the away fixtures you've got left you sort of your travel plans are now there going to affect your preparations are there any that sort of stick out and think right we have to sort of have a work around that yeah, as I say, the the, fir the first fixture, Blackburn, is is probably a f maybe a four hour journey. Um, normally, we would go the day before the Friday to most games. Any anywhere longer than than an hour, we would go the day before the game, stay in a hotel overnight, and that's not going to be possible for unless things change quickly. We don't think that's going to be a, a possibility. So the biggest challenge for us probably is Middlesbrough away. So Middlesbrough, yeah, probably similar to your your trip there yeah. on on Thursday is a, is a long old trek up north um, and yeah we're in discussions at the moment as a staff as to the best way that we plan for that do we go in the morning and and maybe stop en route and do we do we get up there early and, and get the players out walking around or do we leave it and go we don't know we'll, we'll, we'll come to that decision we've got a good few weeks in uh, before that but um, yeah we don't think we'll be able to all travel together on one bus I think we might need two maybe three or just certain staff members take cars and stuff like that so it's all stuff to be honest it's I think the a lot of the off field stuff, the professional professionalism side of it is so important. But sometimes in a scenario like this, it goes back a little bit to before you were professional, when you were playing for your your, your school team or your county, or you travelled maybe not seven hours, but you would you'd, you'd travel, you'd get your food, you get there, you play your match, you go home and get on with the next one. And I think we some we're in danger sometimes of overthinking a lot of things. Of course, yeah, the preparations off the pitch is, is as I say is huge, but. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting for many reasons, none more so than that one. Just I say it, take, it takes you back to being a kid sometimes, just not overthinking it. Yeah. So the uh, the the thought of uh, playing playing away. Um, question from Mike Whitlow for Sebastian: um, Have the performances of the team been better at home than away? It's regarding players uh, worrying about travel, sleep, and unfamiliar surroundings. Well, um, this didn't happen to us, but um, we observed in the first um, match day, the 26th match day, um, that there were only home wins, no away wins in the league. Second league, maybe that has something to do with the travels, with the hotels, um, I don't know, maybe. Um, but 
I can say for us, um, our performance performances, uh, let's compare uh, Nuremberg at home and Osnabrück away, were very similar. So actually it was, didn't make that big difference. Yeah, there's one here for Dean from Michael Renwick. Um, you might part, partly touched on this. What are, what are the guidelines in England with regards to players returning? Is it only first team only? that are allowed to return. I don't know whether you can stretch that out. I mean, say first team only, but are you allowed to also to bring in players from the under 23s to sort of fill out your training sessions? And that's, a, that's a real good question, Michael, actually. I don't know if that's Mike Whitlow that's just asked the previous question. When I, when I was a young kid coming through the, making my way in the game, there was, a, there was a senior player called Mike Whitlow who was amazing with me, the way he looked after me. So if that's you, thank you. What a guy. Um, no, for us, we it's, it was based around the, the testing procedure. So we've, we 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 needed to make sure we had a big enough playing squad and enough support staff that we didn't get get caught cold with someone getting the virus and, and having to be quarantined or an injury to a player. Uh, but at the same time, we didn't want too many people within the training camp where it became a problem with the testing. So uh, for us, we we picked a, a first team squad of players. Uh, we've got. A group of under 23s their season has, has been has finished now so uh, we've put them on a, on a physical training program away from the training ground so they're maintaining fitness and you know if it comes to a point where we need to draft some more members into the squad then you know them lads will be will be up and, and ready to you know to come into the squad but for us it was really important that we as I said there that we didn't bring too many people into the because there was talk initially around going into a, I think you went into a quarantine camp for a week Sebastian prior to the first yes. game there was talk it was talk for us at one point that we might have gone into a camp for maybe six weeks and just stayed there and played the games, trained, didn't go home. That's not going to happen now. So, you know, we want to be really smart, I suppose, and as clever as we can be with, with the testing and just making sure. And we've, we've been very lucky up to now, or we've been very professional, one of the two, where at the moment everybody's negative and, and we hope that that continues. And on that, in terms of different age groups and age levels, um, in term, in Germany, I mean, are there any guidelines return regarding the under 18s and the academy level players yes, returning? Yes, the the two highest leagues, so the under 17s and the under 19s, and um, Bundesliga was cancelled now. So um, there will be a new point um, to start the new season with the new squads, um, and. Now it's uh, it's allowed to to train in small groups um, in the in the youth levels um, without contact, like uh, similar to the group training at the moment. So and this is the the plan for um, also for the grassroots um, grassroots um, season should continue at in September, um, but it's different to all the to all, in in every state. So for example in Bavaria, it's a uh, the plan at the moment is that the, the old season is to be continued in September, but there are also other states like uh, like Baden-Württemberg who already cancelled the the old season. So um, it's up to the to the states, um, and I hope that uh, there will be a general solution for all of them because um, everything else is is chaotic. Okay, thanks, Sebastian. I think. Uh... There's one more question before uh, we wrap up for this evening. Um, Dean, um, just in terms of your own personal development, you know, what, are the, what have been the big takeaways for you in the last six to eight weeks? Oh, that's a great question, Steve. Um, I've been on many of these webinars. I think the biggest thing I've been able to have the time to do is away from football is, is look at, try to look at the best in not just in football I think certainly in English football it's sometimes I get frustrated it's very institutionalized in the way that we do things and it's always been done like this and so I think to be able to sort of look you know more in there so I've been able to speak to top people all around the world I suppose in different sports uh, people I look I've looked up to for many years um, and people in business and things like that so really <laughs> really just making a contact through like LinkedIn or something and, and being a little bit cheeky and, and putting a nice message and saying, you know, I don't know if you've got the time, but if, you know, if we could maybe do a zoom for half an hour at some point, I'd be really, and, and I've, most of the time people have come back with, 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 yeah, we can do that. So 
I've managed to get in front of some great people and learn many things around the way that people do things. Um, as I said, in a time that, that you probably wouldn't normally get to do that. So, um, yeah, for me, it's just been branching out away from away from the game really and trying to and trying to learn different things. I think the psychology is everything in, in whether it's in football or, or the way that people operate in in, in the life. So I'm just trying to really get a lid on that and trying to improve um, the way that I can coach the players. And the game's changing all the time. Young people are. I'm, I'm, I've got kids myself, and you know, the way that you sort of, I suppose, try to get the best of out of, out of youngsters nowadays is different from times gone by. So trying to be creative to find solutions to get the. Ultimately, we're there as coaches to as as important as we think we are. We're there to facilitate the you know the way that the players can go and. Uh, make their own dreams happen, I suppose. So, you know, just trying to find little ways and nuances that you can keep improving. Uh, yeah, that's a good point there. Um, it's almost like a plug for next week's Sunday session. We were hoping to have a group of club psychologists with us. Um, um, Sebastian, the uh, same, same question. I mean, lockdown and back into training and starting the games again. Um, it's been a rich learning opportunity for you what has been the the big takeaways for you in this last six to eight weeks um well i would i would uh, split it into two um two parts the first one is is the football part um of course we we've developed a lot of new new um exercises on the pitch without without contact um and we started to like those um those exercises and we will take them over into the process um for for the future when there is when there's maybe a preseason or something like that um so but also um it brought us away from the from the week to week um rhythm um from game to game so um we had free uh free weekends and you could uh, slow down a little bit for yourself to to recover from from the from the from the weeks you had before um with always uh um, analyzing the last match match focusing on the on the on the on the next again and to break this rhythm and to to recover for yourselves um but uh, and, and the second part is um that uh yeah uh, i could do more more physical activity on my own for example um going for a cycle ride or going for uh for walks um on the weekend and spend time with the family going home and something like that um that was also um an experience now to simple. get new fresh energy simple pleasures yeah it's a good job yeah. you uh, you managed to get them all done then because uh with the fixture program you got at the moment it doesn't sound as if you got much time for that no no but uh we we've recovered but and now it's great to be back in it so and you start this is only the, the, the first weeks that you that you recover for yourself and and some at some point there is the point that you start missing it that you start missing uh um the competition and the yeah facing an opponent and going for for winning and um now we are glad to have that, to have that feeling back and um being in the process right, fantastic sebastian thank you very much for for joining us today um yeah, Congrats thank you very much you. for for the invitation, and I hope um, my or our experiences in Germany can can help you a little bit, and um, that the insight is yeah it's good for you, and hopefully that you are very quick back on the pitch, not just for group trainings. And Dean, thanks a lot for for joining us and, and sharing your insights and where you're at with full with uh sorry with Bristol City at this moment in time. Thank you, Steve. Really enjoyed that. I hope the, the guys listening in have took something from it. Um, Sebastian, great to meet you. And if anyone wants to sort of ask for, ask away, there's you know so I'm on social media and stuff. So if anyone wants to get in touch, yeah, they, they can do, they can do that. Uh, yeah. I, we love to talk football, don't we? So I'll be tuning in next Sunday, Steve. I like the sound of that psychology one. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, I'll help you uh, plugging it then all week long. Just keep using sort of take this clip of this video and uh, use it on social media all week long. So yeah, next week. On the Sunday session, yeah, so that we're hoping we'll have uh, three club psychologists. Um, hopefully, I think it's Chris Wilder from Derby County. Um, we're sort of again, we'll look at other club psychologists uh, uh, at other clubs across Europe to join us and sort of understand what everyone's been doing in, in different leagues. 
So hopefully, yeah, get a good good idea of what's been going on for the last six to eight weeks. Um, but yeah, that's all for na- next week. So yeah, thanks once again, guys, for joining us. And uh, yeah, everyone else out there, thanks for your questions. And hopefully we'll see you all again next week. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks, Sebastian. Enjoy your evening. You too. Bye. See you later.